Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We are about to begin this morning's DINFOS Hall of Fame induction ceremony. As this is an indoor ceremony, during our national anthem, military members are reminded to stand at attention. Civilian guests are encouraged to place their right hand over their hearts. Our ceremony is about to begin. On behalf of the Commandant of the Defense Information School, Colonel Richard McNorton and Command Sergeant Major Randy Randolph, DINFO Senior Enlisted Leader, welcome to this morning's ceremony. My name is Bill Rakoff. I am an instructor in the Public Affairs Communication Strategy Directorate here at DINFOS, and I am delighted and honored to be your Master of Ceremonies this morning. Now, please rise for the arrival of the official party, the presentation of the colors, our national anthem, and the invocation. pray. Come and be with us, Lord, this morning as we take time to recognize some of the Defense Information School's most distinguished graduates at our DINFOS Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Today, we thank you for those who have established a pattern of greatness with their contributions that have been witnessed at the highest levels in our society, all stemming from their time at the Defense Information School. We are delighted, Lord, to be part of this historic event at the 60-year Diamond Jubilee from which DINFOS was established, and are thankful for all of those who have worked so hard to make this day possible. May this ceremony nurture a thriving determination for strength and truth in every DINFOS graduate carrying out their duties today so that we can witness even greater things in the DINFOS Hall of Fame ceremony that is yet to come. Bless our time together as we induct our new class into the Hall of Fame. Amen. Please be seated. I want to especially thank the members of Pershing Zone, the Brass Quintet who showed up today to give us some wonderful music and uh, entertainment and their rousing rendition of the national anthem. Could we give them a round of applause? And, of course, thanks to our Navy Lieutenant Commander Chaplain Jose Jimenez for that very heartfelt invocation. Thank you, sir. We would like to offer this morning a very special welcome to members of our official party. With us today, 
We have Deputy Assistant Secretary, Office of Public and Intergovernmental Affairs for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and today's keynote speaker, Mr. Terrence Hayes. The Commandant of the Defense Information School, Colonel Richard McNorton. And our DINFO Senior Enlisted Leader Command, Sergeant Major Randy Randolph. We also have a number of guests that we are privileged to have with us today, and we'd also like to welcome the following, Air Force Major General Patrick Ryder, the Press Secretary for the Department of Defense. <laughs> Dr. Justin Ward, Director of Operations, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. <laughs> Mr. Max Letterer, the Acting Director of Defense Media Activity. Rear Admiral Ryan Perry, Chief of Information, and Command Master Chief Tony Sistai, Department of the Navy. <laughs> Mr. Jerry Wren, Director of Public Affairs, Office of the Secretary of the Air Force, and U.S. Navy Rear Admiral, retired Stephen Petropoli. <laughs> also with us, on behalf of the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Colonel Scott Cuomo and Sergeant Major Jorge Sedeno Tulak. And from the Army, representing the Office of Chief of Public Affairs, we have Colonel Stacy Hopwood and Sergeant Major Jason Baker. We are also very excited to have some returning Hall of Fame inductees with us today. From the Hall of Fame Class of 2021, retired U.S. Army Sergeant Major James Gilbert. And retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel G.A. Redding. From the Hall of Fame Class of 2022, retired U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major Emma Krauser. And from the Hall of Fame Class of 2023, welcome to Ms. Kathleen Rem and Mr. Glenn Proctor. One final welcome. We're happy to see one of our former DINFOS Commandants here in the room today. Welcome to U.S. Army Colonel, retired Hiram Bell. And finally, to the families, the friends, the special guests of our inductees here and online, we want to welcome you to today's ceremony. It's exciting to have all of you here. Since its establishment in 1964, the Defense Information School has trained and educated soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and Guardians, as well as DOD civilians, international students, and professionals from other government agencies in the principles of public affairs to prepare them to communicate effectively on behalf of their nations and their services. With the consolidation of the Defense Visual Information School and the Defense Photography School in 1998, DINFOS also began to train world-class visual information and broadcast maintenance professionals. Today, DINFOS continues its tradition of excellence preparing public affairs and visual information professionals to communicate with consequence in a rapidly evolving information environment. Our distinguished honorees that you see before you today are part of that proud tradition. They are accomplished in their respective fields and have made extraordinary and lasting contributions at the highest levels in the military, public service, industry, leadership, academia, and entertainment. These honorees represent the very best of our profession and today they will take their rightful place in the DINFOS Alumni Hall of Fame. Our 2024 Hall of Fame inductees are, hold your applause until I get through the list, please. Navy veteran, David Albritton. Air Force veteran, Donald Bishop. Retired Navy Chief, Johnny Bavera. Retired Navy Master Chief, Joe Siokin. Retired Army Major General, Mary Kay Eder. United States Marine Corps Major, Megan McClung and retired Air Force Brigadier General, Ron Rand. We have so much to say about you, and that's coming up in just a little while. But first, it is my honor and privilege to introduce the Commandant of the Defense Information School, Colonel Richard McNorton, for welcoming remarks and to introduce today's keynote speaker. Good morning, DINFOS. Welcome to our distinguished guests, family, and friends. 
Today we are inducting seven new members into the DINFOS Hall of Fame. These DINFOS alumni are being inducted for their exceptional service and accomplishment in the military, in the private sector, and to our nation. These individuals we're recognizing today are linked by more than just their ties to the Defense Information School. Their careers and accomplishments are marked by common themes. Leadership, vision, selfless service, excellence, innovation, transformational impact. All of us who are DINFOS alumni, and that's most of us in this room, should be proud to be found in the same company as these dedicated servant leaders. They are part of a rich and proud heritage that makes this school absolutely unique amongst DOD training institutions. DINFOS is where we train, educate, develop, and inspire the next generation of military communicators. It's a special place. Those who have graduated from here are known across the joint force as DINFOS trained killers. In celebrating our Hall of Fame inductees and their accomplishments, we're also celebrating this amazing institution's 60 years of legacy. Finally, I want to offer my heartfelt congratulations to all of our Hall of Fame inductees and thank you for honoring us with your presence. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Terrence Hayes. He is currently serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Office of Public and Intergovernmental Affairs. In this role, Mr. Hayes leads the VA's Earned Media Marketing Campaign, Crisis and Rapid Response Communication, and serves as official spokesperson for the department. Mr. Hayes is a DINFOS trained killer and served in the Army for over 20 years. He's also an esteemed member of the Army's Sergeant Audie Murphy Club. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terrence Hayes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly an honor to be here with you today as we celebrate a new class of DENFOS Hall of Famers, women and men who have paved the way and left lasting legacies for future DENFOS trained killers to model. Colonel McNorton, Lieutenant Colonel Bender, Command Sergeant Major Randolph, you represent the gold standard of excellence and on behalf of all past, present, and future Defense Information School students, I wanna thank you for today's and every year's Hall of Fame ceremony. I must also thank the wonderful DENFOS cadre for their commitment to excellence. I've had the privilege to attend just about every basic, intermediate, and senior course here. And walking through these halls, and, and I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm having a little anxiety right now. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the secretary was chatting with me earlier and said, uh, while I'm here, go ahead and get some refresher training also. <laughs> But in all seriousness, you know, um, I'm happy to be here because of the legacy that you lead here today. Today's ceremony is a celebration, a time to honor women and men who have and continue to wear their DENFOS pride every day. Women and men who have impacted the lives of so many of our nation's soldiers, Marines, sailors, guardians, and Coast Guardsmen, and many of the civilians serving at the Defense Department VA and other federal agencies like myself. These heavy hitters, public affairs leaders of distinction, pioneers, will now forever be remembered for the legacies they've built. I've never formally attended a Hall of Fame ceremony. So to prepare for my remarks, I had to do what any credible public affairs professional would do. I went into the lab, dug in deep into the vaults, of Hall of Fame induction ceremonies and researched what made past Hall of Famers great at what they do. I watched Ken Griffey Jr.'s Major League Baseball Hall of Fame induction from 2016. I watched Ray Lewis's National Football League Hall of Fame induction from 2018. And I even watched Dolly Parton's induction <laughs> into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame from 2022. I watched several other Hall of Fame inductions in many industries to gauge how those women and men made lasting impacts on their professions. And the more I watched, the more I learned that the main takeaway was not the great work, the catalog, or the resume of these people. Rather, what stuck with me 
was the character of these individuals. If you read through today's program, seeing the names of this year's class. On the surface, you probably see a couple of general officers, some senior NCOs and, the staff, and some staff officers. But let me tell you what I see. I see seven legacy makers who were and are amazing human beings. David Albrighton, Donald Bishop, Johnny Bavera, Joe Siokin, Mary Eater, Megan McClung, Ronald Rand. Many of us have been touched by their grace and compassion, leadership and mentorship, courage and sacrifice. All of these women and men are not here with us today to celebrate what they contributed to our nation, what they contributed to us as people. And while there is a little bit of sadness behind that, I am personally thankful that we were blessed to share the same space as these remarkable people, even only for a season. The names all Britain, Bishop, Bavera, Siokin, Eder, McClung, and Rand will now be etched in stone forever here at the Defense Information School. But let's be honest, these names were already etched in our hearts and in our minds long before today's ceremony. And that's what these women and men will be remembered for. This is a hell of a Hall of Fame class, people. Quite possibly the best yet to be named. If you were to ask any of these Hall of Famers if they had anticipated being recognized here today, all of them would tell you humbly that they simply were honored to serve. That's today's takeaway. When you serve without expecting anything in return, you tend to receive blessings tenfold. Let's use these leaders as a model for not only how we should operate as public affairs professionals, but how we should walk in our daily lives. So again, thank you for affording me the opportunity to return home to Denfos and to express the admiration I have for these seven leaders. Happy 60th anniversary to the Defense Information School and to every individual who has walked these halls. And to quote a line from one of my favorite movies, there's no place like home. <laughs> may God bless you all, and may God continue to watch over our service members, veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayes. We will now formally recognize this year's honorees and induct them into the Dinfos Alumni Hall of Fame. Our first honoree is Navy veteran David Albritton. Mr. Albritton began his remarkable career in the Navy. He served as a surface warfare officer aboard the USS Portland, which deployed to the Persian Gulf in support of operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm in 1990 and 1991. Following two years of graduate school and the completion of the Defense Information School in 1993, he transitioned to become a Navy Public Affairs Officer, serving in the Pentagon on the staff of the Navy Office of Information in Plans and Policy, on the Navy News Desk, and as the aide to the then Navy Chief of Information. He later served as Deputy PAO as Commander-in-Chief U.S. Naval Forces Europe in London. Mr. Albritton's corporate career is impressive. He's an independent director on the board of Embecta Corporation. He's a managing director at CRA Admired Leadership, which is a leadership development and strategic communications firm. His previous senior executive roles included president at General Motors Defense, chief communications officer at Excellus, vice president of communication roles at Amazon Web Services, ITT Defense, and United Way of America, and executive director of global communications at General Motors. Mr. Albritton is a 1988 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He holds a master's in management from the Naval Postgraduate School, completing executive leadership development programs at Harvard and Stanford universities. Among his many recognitions, he was named by Savoy Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential blacks in corporate America. Originally from Philadelphia, Mr. Albritton resides now in the Washington, D.C. area. He's married with three adult children and three grandchildren. 
Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Mr. David Albritton. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is indeed an honor. I am so thankful to have everybody here and the opportunity to speak with you this morning. It's great to see so many old friends here as well. You get away from the community and you, you kind of lose touch. You're connected on Facebook and LinkedIn. But to see some of you know, my great friends from days of old, it's, it's great, you know, definitely an honor. But I am you know, even more excited that all of my family is here. Right? I have mom and dad, my beautiful wife, Kimberly, my, uh, my daughters, Jessica and Adrian, I've got my son Chase, I've got my three grandchildren here, Jay, uh, Zoe, and Irvin. Uh, I've got my sister here, Sherry. Um, we rarely get all together because we're so geographically dispersed between Raleigh, North Carolina, and Philadelphia. But you know, the honor of this ceremony to have them here with me means everything in the world. But I also have my brothers from another mother. I've got three of my classmates from the US Naval Academy here as well. Michael Tabb. Uh, Ken and artist and Colonel Antoine Wright, the U.S. Marine Corps retired. The reason I'm standing here today is because of Michael Tapp. We went to the Naval Academy prep school together. We went to the Naval Academy together. We were surface warfare officers together. Our ships deployed for six months together in the Mediterranean. And then when I went to, went to grad school, he switched careers to become a Navy public affairs officer. I came back to visit him in the Pentagon um, because I was looking to switch careers and I ended up switching to public affairs. Now, ironically, I go to the, the, the Pentagon and go to Chinfo uh, to follow him there. And two months after I get there, he gets out of the Navy. <laughs> but that began a huge you know, legacy for me in terms of you know, how to advance my career. One gentleman who was very extremely instrumental in my success today is sitting right here. It's Rear Admiral Steve Petropoli. Then Commander Steve Petropoli when he ran the Navy news desk. We used to sit in his office and watch him. And I've just absorbed you know, how he would speak to media, how he positioned the Navy story, how he would react to issues, and how he would pour into us as lieutenants that we could take that knowledge and really just carry it forward so that we could effectively execute our jobs you know, on the Navy news desk. I give him that credit. Every time I talk to him, he, he never accepts it, but I'm saying it publicly today because I wouldn't be the executive that I later became if it wasn't for him and others like Rear Admiral Kendall Pease, a legend in Navy Public Affairs. As his aide, that was probably one of my favorite jobs ever, but the opportunity to, to just listen to him, to just absorb all of his knowledge, all of his wisdom, and how much he poured into me just was absolutely you know, advantageous for what happened to me after I got out. Because that, you know, what you just heard in that resume was not the, the guy who showed up here at Denfos in 1993. I graduated from the Academy in 88, and then went off to you know, serve on that ship. And then I became a full civilian for two years. I went to Naval Postgraduate School. I wore my uniform once a month. And I became native. <laughs> and then when I switched careers um, I, and was going to Chinfo, you know, I'd been out of the Navy for the most part for two years. And then I came to Denfos. And what they instilled in me was the ability to recognize how important this role is, and particularly as a junior practitioner, how you were responsible for it. Didn't matter what your rank was. It truly mattered that you owned the story, that you owned, you know, the relationship with, you know, the senior officers across the military. And it was your responsibility to ask that additional question, to show up, you know, show up strongly, to show up with confidence. That 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 was a key word for me. That confidence, because I can tell you, as a midshipman at Naval Academy, if I saw an 06 across the street, I'm crossing the street, so I didn't, you know, salute him. <laughs> And as a person on the ship, you know, a commanding a commander, an 05 was the commanding officer. And so that was my world. And now I'm going to the Pentagon. And a year after I got to the Pentagon, it would not be uncommon for Lieutenant David Albritton to be in the room with Admiral Mike Borer, the Chief of Naval Operations, and a reporter. Or Secretary of the Navy John Dalton and a reporter. Right? That, just, that, it, that talks about the confidence that was instilled in me that started here at Denfos. Then I got out of the Navy in 1998 and my career just advanced. When you hear positions like president of General Motors Defense, you hear about you know, me being an independent board director on the board of a publicly traded company, it all started in 1993 for me. 
And I truly believe that you know, what I learned at this institution uh, was instrumental in my success. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be recognized and deeply honored. Uh, to be here amongst friends, amongst family, is something I'll remember for the rest of my life, and I thank you. One thing I will ask uh, with my fellow awardees, and it's an honor to be here in this class of 2024 with you, I would like for us to come together, and I'd like for us to stay connected and see how we collectively can pour back into this institution as the class of 2024. I make that commitment, and I hope you do too. Thank you, everyone, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Albritton. Our next honoree is Air Force veteran Donald Bishop. After returning from Vietnam in 1970, U.S. Air Force First Lieutenant Donald Bishop attended DINFOS, then located at Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. Assignments at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, and Kwangju Air Base, Korea followed. Mr. Bishop taught history at the Air Force Academy for nine terms before he entered the U.S. Foreign Service as a diplomat. His overseas tour stops included Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and China. Mr. Bishop served as a foreign policy advisor to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and then to the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff. In 2009, Mr. Bishop served as the Country Public Affairs Officer and Acting Director of Communication and Public Diplomacy in Kabul, Afghanistan. He retired in 2010. Mr. Bishop's military decorations include the Bronze Star Medal, Meritorious Service Medal, the Air Force Commendation Medal, and civilian and public service awards from the departments of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. In 2005, he received the Secretary's Award for Public Outreach from Secretary of State Colin Powell, and in 2010, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton recognized his work in Kabul with the department's Distinguished Honor Award. Mr. Bishop and his wife have three sons and seven grandchildren. Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Donald Bishop. I thought I'd share a few hints for career success in public affairs, but I preface my advice by saying that having a loving, capable, and supporting spouse is always a big help. Uh, let me introduce my wife, Gemma. Uh, we met when I was the public affairs officer at at Kwangju Air Base in Korea 51 years ago, and she's helped me all the way in the Air Force and the Foreign Service. And having fine sons helps too. We have three. Two are here today. All three, I might add, are very good writers, so perhaps my DINFOS training influenced the second generation. Thanks, Jerome and John. Our other son, Edward, is a film editor in California jealous that I really learned how to cut film at DINFOS. <laughs> and here are two of the grandchildren, uh, Fern and Milo. As for the public affairs career itself, I offer three short bursts. So instructors, are you, are you taking notes? One, tell the students while they're here to read as many silver anvil case studies as possible. The case studies will broaden their view of the challenges that lie ahead, and perhaps they can adapt an idea or two from the case studies in the future. Two, in their careers, go to the hard places and do the hard things. They will be recognized and advanced. And three, my own career was helped when generals and ambassadors learned I could write a good speech. My advice, then, is to start reading and watching speeches. Not just a few speeches, the current speeches, 
but uh, classic speeches as well. Start with President Franklin Roosevelt's State of the Union Address of 1941. Uh, it aimed to prepare Americans for the coming war, so you can study persuasion, you can study language, and it communicated the concept of the four freedoms, which even now shape our nation. So one, read the silver anvil cases. Two, go to the hard places and do the hard things. And three, read great speeches. And again, thanks for this great honor. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. Our next inductee is retired Navy Chief Johnny Bavera. Chief Bavera served in the United States Navy until his retirement in 2006. During his service, he was a combat cameraman for Combat Camera Atlantic on two separate assignments. Chief Bavera also served White House television during this time. He served as official videographer for President Bill Clinton, covering pivotal events, including meetings with the likes of Nelson Mandela, Boris Yeltsin and Muhammad Ali. He also served as the executive photographer to former Chiefs of Naval Operations, Admiral Vern Clark and Admiral Mike Mullen. During his career, Chief Bavera covered everything from combat and humanitarian missions to maritime operations, including the Bosnia-Herzegovina conflict, the Israeli-Jordan peace treaty, the 1999 earthquake in Turkey, and the war in Afghanistan. His work has been published in numerous books. Chief Bavera currently serves as principal of Visual Media One LLC. He is also the founder and executive director of Shoot Off Visual Media Workshops. He's a founding faculty member of the Red Badge Project, which is a storytelling workshop for veterans with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Chief Bavera is currently the liaison for the Department of Defense to the National Press Photographers Association, and he serves on a number of other professional media organizations. Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Navy Chief Retired, Johnny Bavero. photographers. Now, um, <clears throat> the prior speeches have been short. Please bear with me. I'm more comfortable in front of the podium than behind it. So I wrote my speech down. Um, staff, faculty, distinguished guests, Denfos Information School. This ceremony is not to be taken lightly and this is one I will fondly remember forever. I want to thank some of my uh, DENFOS mentors and colleagues out there that over the years have taught me how to uh, speak more concise and faster because otherwise I would be talking all day. So let's not go there. On the day of when I found out about the induction, there was a, a voicemail that came on my phone, uh, one that I didn't record properly. You know, many of you have gotten that. You know, it's like so-and-so, garble, garble. Well, this one kind of went like, hey, chief, this is Colonel Yada McNorton. <laughs> Denfos, I need to speak to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, as a, a retired non-com, uh, and back in my day, there were Two reasons for getting a, a call from upper management, <laughs> say like the one from Colonel. One is that they wanted or needed something, and that's fine. Or worse, you or someone you're responsible for is in trouble. So this little bit of anxiety started to creep in, and I was able to call the Colonel back, 
and I was quickly reminded that there's a third reason for getting a call like that. One of personal gratitude and, and congratulations. And on that day, Colonel McNorton, you turned my frown upside down. Thank you, sir. So last year, Marquis, Marquis Who's Who Biographical Register contacted me for inclusion. And one of their questions were, what three things embody who you are? What do you live by? I thought about it. It's like, hmm. So they want to know my code. Well, it's perseverance, dreams, and relationships. They're the essentiality of what keeps me moving forward daily. Because you have to persevere at your most lowest and challenged time. And if the dream is big enough, the rewards are big. Bigger the dream, bigger the reward. I'm part of that better to have tried and failed category than to have not tried at all. Successes. Well, they're born from many unsuccessful challenges. It's our dreams that give us hope, from little goals to impossible ones. So you have to be open to the many infinite possibilities that await us daily. Now, I know I could not have gotten where I am without relationships. This room and some of the people in it encompass my, my career's history. They influence me in, in the best of intentions. In my life, I'm, I'm thankful for my family, to my grandmother, Josephine, who showed me the power of foresight. My mom instilled faith. My dad, he taught me how to stand up for myself. Stay in that batter's box, boy. Stay in there. Shout out to my college photography professor, Warren Thompson, and the Team Tri-X friends. They taught me that, hey, it's OK to be different. The power of the lens and the mind behind it, they instilled relevance. Thank you, Commander Bertrand Wendell, wherever you are. I'm hoping you're watching online. You introduced me to RIT in the great big world called naval, naval photography and to all my naval photography shipmates. And he sent me TAD to my first carrier, the USS Eisenhower. Man, I enjoyed every minute of it. I won't mention three men who many, many of us simulate today. Mr. Ken Hackman, Chip Mowry, Russ Egner, they taught us the power of paying it forward. Many of us live up for that. Now, if it weren't for these gentlemen, many of us would probably not be in this room. And mostly to my wife, Kirsten. She's my dream come true. We, we met in the middle of the Rose Garden of the White House. And when I finally got the nerve to ask her out for a date, it was in the elevator of the old executive office building. She gave me her phone number. Now, if you don't believe that story, you can ask Secretary Madeleine Albright, who was standing behind us. <laughs> uh, see, here I am. Where am I? <laughs> to my most amazing, to our most amazing talented daughter, Amelie. And she's our dream come true. When I was 23 when I first got published. Half the front page of the local city paper. But damn if this kid didn't go and out, outshine her dad. So while at senior year at Stanford Online High School, her Latin class published a book. They were all 17 years old. You know, they, they, they translated some Latin stuff into English, and, and even in English, I couldn't understand what I was reading. <laughs> but she inspires us. So whether it's ours or that of others, we are a lucky bunch. We share many equivalent stories 
and experiences. Now, if you want to, want to know a few of them, you can talk to Commander Toby Marquez. Where are you, Toby? There he is, a first Syracuse class graduate. Still working, still shooting. Now, if you want to hear some stories, you can talk to him. I mean, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate to have had a lifetime of success through persevered challenges and the many amazing people that our, our skill set opens us up to. We are granted access. I met and sat next to Rosa Parks on a park bench at a train station in, in Cincinnati. She and I talked alone for 20 minutes about life before having to disappear, disappear back into reality. I met my childhood astronaut hero, John Glenn, out of the blue at an event. He broke stride from where, I, where he was going only to come right for me and shake my hand. And he said, how you doing, son? It was this hand. So I'd end up flying with him on Air Force One on some of these trips down the road at the White House. And then in the later years, I'd see him at, you know, once, once or twice a year at Quantico. Now we practice being flies on the wall, but what do you do when a king of an ancient Hashemite kingdom of Jordan comes up to you for conversation? I was with my crew chief, Skip No Cielo. I couldn't get past the fact that this man's direct royal bloodline went beyond that of the Prophet Muhammad. But yet, here I am, a simple guy who started out with nothing to be in the presence of such greatness. These are very condensed stories that many of us have. But we are skilled storytellers. I'm and we tell stories of others' experiences. And that in itself is an honor. Uh, I'm so grateful that you have me up here and humbled to my posse that uh, was responsible for getting me up here, putting it all together. You know who you are. Thank you. And again, for Dinfos, you are the foundation in the future of our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Rivera. Our next honoree is retired Navy Master Chief Joe Siokin. Master Chief Siokin's long career in military broadcast journalism included covering the Muse, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis the assassination and the state funeral of President John F. Kennedy, and the orbital flight of NASA astronaut Gordon Cooper. Just touching the surface here. Master Chief Siokin volunteered to be a broadcaster in Lebanon in 1983, and he was subsequently injured in the attack on the Marine barracks that killed 241 servicemen. Master Chief Siokin's achievements throughout his 30-year Navy career and two civilian retirements include a Purple Heart to Excellent in Prince War, for Naval Air Station Lakehurst, the Vietnam Service Medal with a Star, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross Unit Citation, and the Combat Action Ribbon. He is also the recipient of the Navy Commendation Medal for Meritorious Service at Southern Command Network for the American Forces Radio and Television Services Panama, and another Navy Commendation Medal for his service as an instructor at the Defense Information School at Fort Benjamin Harrison. Siokin was instrumental in arranging and running the Distinguished Visitor Program at Naval Air Force U.S. Pacific Fleet for many years following his Navy retirement in 1988. After his second retirement in 2003, Siokin was an original team member of the USS Midway Museum in San Diego, volunteering more than 10,000 hours of his time. And his voice, by the way, still narrates the museum's audio tour. Master Chief Siokin was beloved by those who worked alongside him. As one shipmate said about serving with him in Vietnam, and this is a quote, had he been on the river with me, I would have trusted him with my life, my boat, my shotgun, and my beer. <laughs> Master Chief Joe Siokin died in 2021 after a long and memorable life of service to his country. 
Mr. Hayes and Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Joe Siokin, and accepting on behalf of their loved one, his wife, Mary Siokin, his daughter, Navy Chief Lisa Siokin, and his sons, Joe and Ramon Siokin. Good morning to everyone here and online. I am Personnel Specialist Chief Petty Officer Lisa Siokin. I am joined today with my mother, Mary Curas Siokin, who was a personnelman in the uh, Vietnam War era. And my brother Ramon in the back here. <laughs> He's actually um, part of the uh, commercials and uh, film industry. So he's on IMDB if you want to look him up, hire him. <laughs> And uh, my brother Joe the third over here, he's a um, uh, Desert Storm era uh, for the Navy. Uh, I would first like to take some time to thank a handful of people in a very long list of names directly involved in my dad's acceptance today. Retired journalist chief Art Frith, happy early birthday tomorrow, turning 39 again. <laughs> Retired Journalist Chief Bob Brucker, Retired Journalist Senior Chief Sonny Ald and Steve Feebing, Retired Fleet Master Chief Randy Kafka, Rear Admirals Charlie Brown and Tom Drakowski, Master Chief Mike Lewis, Commander Joe Quimby, and Lieutenant Commander Tina Tallman. I would also like to thank what's known as our family handler and travel assists. Retired Master Chief Mel Weatherspoon, Mr. Rivers Johnson, Greg Strupp, Thomas Hughes, and of course, a huge thank you to Chinfos Senior Enlisted Advisor Master Chief Tony Sistai, and the Denfos Commandant Colonel Richard McNorton. Thank you again for the opportunity to accept this honor on behalf, behalf of my late father. He is deeply missed by all who knew him. I'm about to tell a personal story that many may not know about Joe. My father and his two young sisters came from humble beginnings. He was born in Eldon, Missouri, January 18th, 1939, and grew up in the Ozarks and then St. Louis. He said he had a very Huckleberry Finn upbringing, having lakes and nature surroundings. But the neighborhoods they could afford to live in were poverty stricken. As a young teenager, my father was unfazed by the signs of segregation posted wherever he went. You see, although my grandfather, Joe Siokin Sr., he was Filipino, but he was very, treated very poorly. And after hailing from a life as a teacher prior to arriving here, and my grandmother, Wilma Jean, having been unfortunately treated poorly as well and called horrible names early on, when her three children were a little older and running around their neighborhood, her very Austrian German background came out when she got wind that her kids weren't being allowed in the whites only section. She rigidly walked into that area with her brood so everyone would know not to mess with her kids and they could go anywhere they damn well pleased. My dad never forgot that moment. So when he attended Hadley Technical High School and honed in on his artistic skills, he soon set his sights on joining our beloved United States Navy as a reservist, age 17. Then a year later, into active duty. He was pushed towards becoming a cook, as was the norm for non-white service members, but he continued his gust for art and found there was photography A school. Thank God for that and the rest is history. His first paycheck he spent money on was candy. The simple things 
yet things they didn't have the luxury to buy before him joining. Later, he bought his dad a new car, which brought tears to eyes that may have been dried for years. My father was not just a good man, an honest man, a devoted husband, father, and great friend and colleague to myriad, but he was always inclusive. This stemmed from his own treatment of himself and his family, so just remember the good you felt from him if you ever got the chance to meet him, or even if you had a, a tour from him on the Midway Museum, or if you never met him and you just heard the stories today. Keep that good memory with you, but also share that feeling. He lives on through all of us. Thank you again, and lastly, I'd like to end with the Armed Forces Vietnam Network group mission statement. In uniform, we forged a common bond. In civilian life, we remain committed to a strong national defense and to a well-trained, well-equipped, and diverse military force that is representative of the entire country. We respect each other's opinions, although we may not always agree with each other. In times of national emergency, we put personal and political differences aside. We may not know one another personally, but we trust each other. And if the call to serve comes again and we are able, we will gladly do so. As veterans and broadcasters, we share a mutual interest in the independence and diversity of opinion reflected by a healthy and competitive media. To that end, we regret the tendency toward consolidation and concentration of media ownership. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Chief Siokin and the Siokin family. Our next honoree is retired U.S. Army Major General Mary K. Eder. Major General Eder served over 36 years in the United States Army, both active duty and reserve. Her assignments include the U.S. Army's Department Chief of, or, I'm sorry, Deputy Chief of Public Affairs, Commander of the 6th Brigade Professional Development, 80th Division Institutional Training, while concurrently serving on active duty as the Chief of Staff with the Reserve Forces Policy Board in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Major General Eder served with the United States European Command, where she was assigned as the Deputy Director of Public Affairs. There, she directed the theater media relations during NATO operations in Kosovo and at the inception of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Major General Eder served in a number of senior positions in the Pentagon on the Army staff as Deputy Chief of Public Affairs and Deputy Chief of the Army Reserve and with the Department of Defense's Reserve Forces Policy Board. She speaks and writes frequently on communication topics. She has been published in USA Today, Time Magazine, The Hill, and other outlets. Among her works, Major General Eder is the author of Leading the Narrative, The Case for Strategic Communication and Public Relations in the Military, The Scope, Dynamic, and Future of Military Communications, co-written with several of her DINFOS colleagues. General Eder holds a bachelor's and master's degree in English from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. We now call it Penn West University. She also has a master's degree in strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College and an advanced certificate in mass communications from the University of South Carolina. Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Army Major General Retired Mary K. Eder. It's such an honor to be back home at DINFOS and with the public affairs community. But my road to this place on this day started at Fort Meade. <clears throat> I was a first lieutenant in the 519th Military Police Battalion here at Fort Meade, and I was not happy to be there. <laughs> I wanted to get into the public affairs career field, and I didn't know how to do it. So one day, I was doing a extra duty. I was leading the 
small group that went out to lower the flag. That was an MP responsibility. And while I was standing there waiting for retreat to begin, I was disappointed, I was frustrated, and I wasn't thinking about the moment I was in. Out there on the, on the parade field in front of what was First Army, there was a little boy with a kite. And as the first note sounded of To the Colors, he put the kite down and he saluted. And that moment brought me back <clears throat> and it renewed my spirit and my determination to get into this career field. It took me a while. A couple of years later, I was looking to join a reserve unit, which didn't exactly happen often at that time. And <clears throat> so I was being interviewed. And they said, well, we have a few openings in logistics. And I said, no, I want to be in public affairs. Well, we have some other openings over here. No, I want to be in public affairs. And finally, they said, fine. We will call the public affairs officer and see if he will accept you. So they called up the major who was the public affairs officer for the division. His name was Glenn Devere. He was not a PAO type. And they asked him if I could join. And he said, well, why not? <laughs> My career began with, well, why not? <laughs> but it opened the door. And my lesson from that was be the person who opens the door for others. <clears throat> Throughout my career after that, I learned to volunteer for the jobs no one else wanted, for the things that I was afraid to do, for the jobs that were challenging. When I was what was then Fort Lee, and now thankfully is Fort Greg Adams, I was asked if I would speak at the quartermaster pre-command courses and talk media to them. I had never done this. I wasn't a public speaker. And so for the first one, I am in the back of the room, and they had me mic'd up, which was a mistake. <laughs> because I could see all of those people out there in the dark, and all you could hear was <laughs> So I was a little nervous. <clears throat> but I taught in every course there then for several years. And it helped me become better at expressing myself, at doing public speaking, at doing media interviews, and helping others, because every time I did it, I learned something too. For everyone I have met in this community, they have given me more back than I have ever given to them. I have learned so much from everyone I have known throughout my career. I was so fortunate to spend time in Germany and work with our international allies and partners. My German is still pretty poor, but I learned how to do some interviews in German. Thankfully, none of you will ever see those. <laughs> so what I had learned throughout my career was to be the one who opens the door, to be the one who says, why not? And let someone have the chance to move forward. I'm so fortunate to have so many friends. I had the best Navy bosses at UCOM when I was in Germany. I had the best Air Force colleagues I could imagine. And everyone taught me so much about their careers, their culture, their outlook, and I just felt blessed to be there. So if you ask me where I'm going to be today at 5 o'clock, I'm going to be on the parade field out there for retreat. And I'm going to feel my spirit renewed and be thankful once again for all the blessings I have enjoyed through being part of this incredible community. Thank you. Thank you, General Leader. Our next honoree is United States Marine Corps Major Megan McClung. Be bold, be brief, and be gone. Those were the words that Major Megan McClung lived by. She was born into a long line of military professionals. Major McClung began her career in 1995, serving on active duty until 2004 when she entered the U.S. Army Reserve and began to work as a private contractor in Iraq. But the call of service is strong, 
and Major McClung returned to active duty in the United States Marine Corps in 2006, deploying to Iraq as a public affairs officer with the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. She promoted to the rank of Major in June of 2006, and she served as Chief Public Affairs Officer in Al-Anbar Province. On December 6, 2006, Major McClung was escorting Newsweek journalists when she was killed by an impro improvised explosive device. She became the first female Marine Corps officer and the first female graduate of the United States Naval Academy to be killed during the Iraq War. Major McClung was laid to rest with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery where her headstone bears her iconic phrase, be bold, be brief, and be gone. Major McClung's leadership in her brief time shaped the reporting of the war. Greg Overbeck and Commander Wesley Huey wrote in their book, Leadership Embodied, that her expert power, combined with her strong interpersonal relationship skills, resulted in her materially impacting the media message coming out of Al Anbar province during the height of the insurgency. And the biography in your program will tell of the many awards and honors that keep Major McClung's legacy alive but I will point to, with no small amount of pride, the Major Megan McClung Leadership Award here at DINFOS. It is awarded to outstanding graduates of our Public Affairs and Communication Strategy Qualification course. Her leadership and her dedication to country continue to set the standard for Marines and for service members everywhere. Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Major Megan McClung, U.S. Marine Corps. Her aunt, Ms. Carol Blumenthal, will accept the honor on behalf of Major McClung. Good morning. Good morning. You're talking to, you're now being spoken to by someone who has had not had the benefit of any DINFOS training whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, please forgive me. But I did want to make a few remarks to say thank you. On behalf of the McClung family, thank you for honoring and remembering the accomplishments of my niece, Major Megan McClung. Megan personified gusto. She had an enthusiasm for life, for her mission, and for getting out the word of the bold and brave accomplishments of her fellow Marines and other service members. She loved the Marine Corps and the men and women who knew her Service members and civilians were inspired by her energy, her optimism, and her grasp of the big picture that public affairs, of her public affairs mission. Meeting her was an experience not easily dismissed or forgotten. As her mother told me, being in the moment, being present, that was Meg's gift. When you were with her, she saw you, she heard you. Her presence left an indelible imprint. If you met her, you remembered her. And we remember her still today, and you remember her here today. Meg died while serving as a media relations officer in Iraq in 2006. She was escorting journalists doing a story about U.S. forces training Iraqi police. She died doing her job, fully present, fully committed to the Marines, to her mission, and to each person that she met along the way. Meg lives today in our hearts and our memories. She'd be honored to know of her induction into the DINFOS Alumni Hall of Fame and to share in the distinguished company of the other inductees. 
On her behalf and the McClung family, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blumenthal. Our final inductee into the Dinfos Hall of Fame Class of 2024 is retired Air Force Brigadier General Ron Rand. General Rand's public affairs career spans a half century, beginning as a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy in 1971. He served as officer in charge of the Air Force Motion Picture Laboratory, and he commanded two photo detachments in Thailand. General Rand transitioned to a public affairs career in 1981, serving the Air Force during crises such as the Challenger explosion in 1986, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, and the attacks of September 11, 2001. General Rand went on to serve as the Director of Air Force of Public Affairs, where he led at the effort to rebrand the service's identity, including today's Air Force symbol. He served as the communications consultant to President George W. Bush's Commission on Moon, Mars, and Beyond. In the private sector, he served as Vice President of Communications for Pratt & Whitney, Senior VP of Communications for Lockheed Martin, and he was the President and CEO of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. Mr. Hayes, Colonel McNorton, and Command Sergeant Major Randolph will now formally present the honor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to ask you to welcome DINFO's 2024 Hall of Fame inductee, Air Force Brigadier General Retired, Ron Rand. Good morning, and uh, thanks for that. And thanks to uh, Colonel McNorton and Rivers Johnson and Major Woods and the whole DINFO staff for making this possible. I'm glad you talked about what a DTK is. I've been a DTK since I went to a SPAOC course at Fort Bend back in Indian No Place back in 95. <laughs> and I've been honored, humbled, and proud to be a DT DTK all those years. And this recognition that you bestow on us today is even beyond, beyond that. Honored, humbled, proud to be part of this group. Um, public affairs is a lot like life itself. It's a team sport. And I was lucky, as everyone else has pointed out, to have a great team at home. My wife, Bernie, the love of my life, my daughter Emily, the light of my life, Em's husband Chris, I'm from a big family, there were 12 of us. Mom and Dad uh, taught us that our best friends in life are gonna be each other. My brother Mike and his wife Andrea are here with us today all the way from Seattle, Washington. I've got siblings in Massachusetts, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, California, and they're all probably watching this online or live streaming it or whatever you call it. <laughs> I, I guess I didn't do enough DINFOS training to have the, <laughs> the right words. But besides the strength of the family at home, we had a family in Air Force Public Affairs. And public affairs, when you think about it, as a wise young person told me this morning, and as Chief Bavera pointed out before, is really about telling stories. It's about telling stories. And in the services that we are part of, we have such great stories to tell. And I was fortunate to be surrounded along the way by people like Don Brownlee, Pat Ryder, Jerry Wren, and a thousand others who passed on what they knew, shared their ideas, uh, collaborated, argued, uh, but came to a point of understanding that what we were trying to do was tell a great story. Let's tell it the best way we can in the biggest way we can. And where we all learned to tell those stories was here at DINFOS. DINFOS teaches us to tell those stories. It's such important work you do here, so important for the future of our country, for the future of our services. 
And these, I don't know, what do you do? You put like 6,000 students through here a year? 3,000? 3,000 students every year going out, carrying on that legacy, telling those stories. It's important work you do. Uh, it's worthy work. I was, uh, I loved public affairs. I loved every minute of public affairs. I loved the challenges. I liked doing the jobs that no one else wanted to do. I liked going to places that no one else would go. Uh, I liked the fact that nobody knew everything, but all of us together are always smarter and better than any one of us. And if you understand that, it's kind of like a Pink Floyd song. The Pink Floyd Dark, Dark Side of the Moon album has a song on it called Breathe. And there's a line in Breathe that sort of describes the public affairs journey. Long we live and high we fly, and tears we give and, and smiles we give and tears we cry. But all we touch and all we see is all in life will ever be. We take and we give to everybody along the way. And that's what makes those stories come out as good as they do. If I weren't so old, and if the Air Force didn't have limits on how old you could be, I'd probably still be doing that job. But to Dinfos, keep up the good work. Thanks for this recognition. I'm just a kid from Quincy, Massachusetts, and I got to serve my country for all those years in, in this very special job called Public Affairs. Highlight of my life. Thank you all. God bless America. Just a side note that I did not have Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon lyrics on my Dinfos Hall of Fame bingo card today. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations again to all of our honorees. Another round of applause, please, for the Defense Information School Alumni Hall of Fame, Class of 2024. And a quick personal note, if I may, General Leader, you touched on something just a moment ago, and I just want to reinforce it. You talked about centering moments, moments that pull you back in. It's events like this, it's events like this that for my colleagues and for me, center us with the daily grind of what we do, educating DINFOS trained killers. We thank you. We thank you those for those of you who paved the way. We thank those of you who are still doing it every single day and giving us inspiration for what we do and hopefully paving the way for future Hall of Fame inductees here. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'm going to ask the class of 2024 to please come to the stage for a group photo. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. We are going to invite everyone to form a line to my right, behind the official party, and the distinguished guests to personally congratulate the inductees. Once more, a round of applause for our 2024 Hall of Fame inductees. Thank you very much for attending and for watching online. <laughs>